Good to see all of you this morning. Happy Sabbath. What a blessing it is to be able to worship God on His holy day and to know the difference between what is holy and what is not holy. Um, you know, I, I was not always a Christian, certainly not always a Sabbath keeper. Do we have any people here uh, who were Sunday keepers or just not Christian at all before? We've got lots of Sunday keepers, previous Sunday keepers in here. Just call out a couple of reasons of what, what brought you to the Sabbath. What, what was it that pulled you out of Sunday? Go ahead and freely speak. The truth. What about the truth? Was it, was it God's word you went in? Was it somebody approaching you, as our brother told us in his testimony earlier? Somebody really trying to present to you the truth? Was it just seeing that the, the error of, let's say, the Catholic Church? Was it... Was it, what was it about the truth that pulled you into Sabbath that made you say, I have to make a change about my life? Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Amen. That was a big one for me realizing this is not a church issue, but a God issue, right? This is, this is God speaking to his people, setting aside a day for himself to spend time with us. And that really touched my heart to say, I better get serious about this too. So we're kind of going in a series here. And I don't know if everybody have, have been part of the last two talks that I've had here but this will be a continuation of that. And we've seen that in the previous lectures that there's a war going on that as Adventists, we are responsible to help others understand this war and also ourselves follow God's prescribed methods to overcome in this war, not by our own means, but by his means. And he's given us by his grace help in the Adventist faith of Sister Ellen White, who expounds wonderfully on the greater light of the Bible and gives us uh, a, a deeper sense or understanding of what this war is about and, and how we can go about fighting this war. This is uh, the seventh volume of Testimonies to the Church. The great conflict that Satan created in the heavenly courts is soon, very soon, to be forever decided. Soon, all the inhabitants of the earth will have taken sides either for or against the government of heaven. How many people are involved in this battle? All the inhabitants of earth. And our brother in his testimony this morning said he has trouble witnessing to people who don't want to hear this. Are those people, whether they like it or not, going to be involved in this conflict? Absolutely. And this is what really strikes me is I have lots of people I witness to that couldn't care less what I have to say on the topic, yet I ask them to, to let it plant a seed. Just let it resonate somewhere in your heart and mind, even if it's far, far back, because at some point, you're going to become a participant in this war, whether you like it or not. And if you're not ready for it, chances are you're going to be a participant for the wrong side, because this whole thing, as it was in the Garden of Eden, is set up as a deception. Now, as we've never before, Satan is exercising his deceiving power to mislead and to destroy every unguarded soul. It's exactly what I'm talking about. We are called to arouse the people to prepare for the great issues before them. We must give warning to those who are standing on the very brink of ruin. Do we have a responsibility in this? We certainly do. We have been given an absolute privilege to be able to sit here and understand the truth to the depth and fullness that God has allowed us in this faith. Amen? Amen. So a lot of my um, talks on these are focused on our responsibilities to our brothers and sisters. And if you could just bow your heads and pray with me one more time before we really get in. Father in heaven, I'm so unworthy to be given this message. I'm so humbled to hear so many um, wonderful lessons from my brothers and sisters this morning in Sabbath school. They are true servants, Lord, and I just hope to be one of those servants. 
Father, please don't um, let any of my words come across today. Let they be your words. Father, let the lessons that we learn be edifying for us all. I was edified as I put this together, Lord, and I just ask that whatever your will, that each hearer may hear what they need to help in their salvation and the salvation of those in their lives. Father in heaven, we can do nothing of ourselves, and so we sit here as little children seeking to learn from your great truth, from your great son whom you allowed to come here and give himself for us. So thank you, Lord, for these, and please be with me now as I give this message in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. God's people are to put forth every power in combating Satan's falsehood and pulling down his strongholds. So are we supposed to give a little effort in this? Or every fiber of our being? And it's really hard to do because the cares of this world, they, they nip at us. The temptations, they pull at us. We're fallen beings in a fallen world. Our default setting is to do not what God wants, <laughs> not give every fiber of our being. But I think, as we've seen in the trials of God's people throughout time, God allows these trials to help us get serious sometimes. And I think the last few years has shown us how quickly things can change and how quickly we can be divided into one of two camps, as we saw in the previous verse, either one or the other. My, my secular friends often call me narrow-minded and pigeonholed to one view because I say there's only two ways, the way of life and the way of death, right? Even though the world presents almost innumerable options to choose from, you only have two options, the way of life or the way of death. The, the Bible says, store up yourselves treasure in heaven. Brother Facundo was talking about the prosperity gospel. That's storing up treasures on earth where moth and dust, dust corrupt. So here we are with the opportunity and the knowledge that we have to store up the most precious treasure one could ever have, an eternal treasure in Jesus Christ. To every human being, in the wide world who give heed, we are to make plain the principles, and that's what we're going to look at today, the principles at stake in the great controversy, principles upon which hangs the eternal destiny of the soul. I don't know if it could get more important than that. The eternal destiny of the soul, and what is eternal? It's not just eternal life, but eternal death. That's not something I'd wish on my worst enemy. I'd rather have my worst enemy, which I don't have a lot, but I think in the greater scheme of things, I know that a lot of people give people, you know, Trudeau a hard time. We need to pray for him. A lot of people give the Pope a hard time. We need to pray for the individual man, not the seat of the Pope, but the individual man there. Whether he turns or not, our job, one of the signs that we are true followers of Christ, is we pray for those who persecute us and hate us. Right? The destiny of every soul is on the line. To the people far and near, we are to bring home the question, are you following the great apostate and disobedience to God's law? Are you following the Son of God who declared, I have kept my father, Father's commandments. This is the work before us. Is it an easy work? No. Is it a fun work? It can be. <laughs> Once we get to the other side of it, once we see somebody, that light bulb moment by the Holy Spirit's power, come on and say, wow, there's something here. That's a fantastic moment. And if we have joy in that moment, imagine what the courts of heaven do when they see something like that. Oh, it gives us hope. Because a lot of people hear my messages and hear a lot of bad. And that's my fault. Because God has placed in my heart to try to get us ready for what the enemy is going to do. The biggest enemy for us, oftentimes, is ourselves. It's our hearts. Our hearts are deceptively wicked. They can't be trusted. I, my whole life has been learning that lesson, <laughs> fighting my own self, even to this very day. And so I, I want to just quickly touch on that there are multiple angles of preparation that we're dealing with, and my angle for, for my ministry here is to focus largely on the external. What is the beast doing? What can we do to stop the dragon from deceiving us? But one of the most important battles we deal with is the internal sanctification. Walking closer to God. 
Righteousness by faith, victory over sin. And I want to praise God for my other brothers and sisters, especially Brother Andrew, who focuses on this message. So when he preaches, please come and see him. Because when you see my sermons here, you're only getting part of the story. Now, by God's grace, those two things put together will prepare us for the battle ahead. Okay? The hand cannot be the foot. The foot cannot be the the head. So each part must work together for the glory of God. And I will say, most people get drawn to this when the majority of the work is there. Right? So, please forgive me for only being on this part, but please seek out our brothers and sisters who are preaching on this part and Sister White's writings because this is the part that will keep us from salvation more than anything. Yes, the enemy can do all sorts of things, but it's ourselves, our own selfish hearts that have a higher probability of keeping us from our Savior than these things. Just want to lay that out there. Okay, so from our previous talks to kind of catch people up where we are, because it might be a lot for those who haven't heard these things before, we identified in previous sermons the identities of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. We know the dragon is Satan. We know the beast is the papacy. We know the false prophet is Protestant America. We identified the false prophet's use of miracles. That was the last one where we went in depth on what those miracles are look like and that when these miracles begin, it will generate intense religious interest. The types of miracles that are going to be used are defined by Sister White as spiritualism and we looked at what that means. Spiritualism is talking to the dead and even the dead returning. We saw in the last lecture, the apostles are going to come back and say that they've changed what they wrote before. Can God's word change? Does Jesus Christ change? The same yesterday, today, and forever. We learned that the spirits and Satan himself will say God's word has changed, but what is the special object of the changing of this message? When they come here, yes, they say God's word's changed, but what specifically is their focus? Sabbath. Sabbath worship. These miracles will lead the American public first and then the rest of the world, which we saw last time. America first, then the rest of the world. These miracles, this religious interest will lead America to make an image of the beast, which then the mark of the beast becomes into effect. Is Sunday worship the mark of the beast right now? It's not. Can it be for somebody right now? Yes. How? Because they can know the truth reject it, and still go knowing that Sunday is wrong. But on a corporate level, on a, on a more macro level, it's not the mark of the beast until the image is set up. So can our brothers and sisters still be witness to at this point? Absolutely. So knowing this, we can start to become more prepared for what Satan's going to use against us as these times come upon us. Because once As we saw again over the last couple years, how fast things happen. Once these miracles begin, once this shift towards religious interest interest begins, brothers and sisters, it's going to move fast. And it's going to be intense. It's going to be so overwhelming that if we're not ready and we're not prepared, we're going to get emotionally worked up and in it, and that doesn't do anybody any good. God wants us working from his word, not from our deceptive hearts. God's people are to put forth every power in combating Satan's falsehood and pulling down his strongholds. To every human being in the, in the wide world, we are to give heed. We are to make plain the principles at stake. I think I've already, already did that one. Okay, so I want to start creating almost a curriculum here of things that we all need to get really, really sound on in order to combat the external threat that we're dealing with. Again, this is not the internal as much as it is is the external. And the number one thing is going to be the Sabbath. This is the central point of Satan's object of attention. He's even willing to bring people seemingly back from the dead just to tell you that it's Sunday and not Sabbath. So the second thing we're going to need, and we're only going to focus on this today, the idea is this becomes a curriculum and each one of these becomes its own sermon and lecture, because this is how important it is that we're going to need to be. We're going to need to be able to prove from the scriptures why we believe what we believe in a sound, calm, Christ-like demeanor. State of the dead, this is the means by which the Sunday argument will be exalted. The millennium, 
Does anyone know why the millennium will be important for this deception? Because they're going to say, when these spirits come back and when Satan appears, that the millennium has started. How could you combat that? By knowing what the real millennium is like. Where does the real millennium take place? Yeah, it's going to be real hard for the millennium to take place here when we know it's up there. If we can prove that from the scriptures, people can be moved. We need to know what the remnant church is, the characteristics of the group of people who must stand for this time. Because if there's a remnant church, a remnant's a small group. Here at the millennium, they're going to say pretty much the whole world's involved. How is that a remnant? That's not a remnant. And those people will do what? They'll keep the commandments of God and they'll have the faith and testimony of Jesus Christ. These are characteristics of the remnant. We must know why the word cannot change. We must be able to defend why the word cannot change. Because it's going to be really hard to sit here and say, well, look, Jesus showed up and the apostles are here and they said they changed, the, they changed the day. They changed the word. Can't they? Don't they have the authority to change it? I think this is why God makes it so clear that not one jot or tittle will fall away from the law. Nothing will change from his word. It is our rock to build a foundation on. <clears throat> we need to know the false prophet because we need to be able to point out that they're the main drivers of all of this. We need to show why they're false prophets. We need to understand the investigative judgment and the close of probation. Because if Jesus came back and the millennium started, do people even know that there's a judgment that has gone on or a probation period for their own lives or for the world? Well, they think the millennium started. They don't know. They're none the wiser. And I believe we looked at, when these things happen, there is still time to, for people to be converted. Probation has not closed yet. Sister White writes, as it was in the day of Pentecost, thousands will be converting by the day at the 11th hour. Now it's a blessing that we don't have to wait for this 11th hour, but it's also a blessing that our brothers and sisters will earn the same wages that we have worked, even if we labor in the fields of Christ our whole lives, earn the same reward that we got if they show up at the last minute and praise God for that. I'm not looking, I don't think any of us are looking or should be looking for any special privilege just because we put our whole lives into it and somebody converts at the last minute and, and receives eternal life. That is a true testament to God's character, a true testament to his forgiveness, that the blood of the lamb is worthy to cover all sins. We need to understand the false second coming and the false miracles so we can point people out the difference between the real and the fake. And the last one is God's law, showing that it's an expression of his character. In those, for you previous Sunday keepers, how many of your churches exalted the law of God is still void today, or is still um, uh, uh, binding today? I don't think any of them. So when it says the remnant church keep the commandments of God, how many Protestant churches have just been excluded? Sure. And it means the worship of church and state No, and you're right. Uh, they, they may think that they are exalting it in some way, but then they're teaching that it, it's void and no longer binding. Well, what does that do with the, the law? And what does that do to Christ's sacrifice? So why is Sabbath number one on the list? And for those of you who know most of this stuff, I'm not presenting anything new or groundbreaking today. I'm just really bringing together what God has shown Adventists for many, many years and that we just need to be rooted on. In gentle, compassionate tones, he, Satan, presents some of the same gracious heavenly truths which the Savior uttered. He heals the diseases of the people. And then, in his assumed character of Christ, he claims to have changed the Sabbath to Sunday and commands all to hallow. What does hallow mean? holy, commands all to keep holy the day which he has blessed. He declares that those who persist in keeping holy the seventh day, so let me ask you something, is he saying the day he's blessing is the seventh day? No. He's not pretending to make it the seventh day. Back to does God's word change? No. So he's saying that all who keep holy the seventh day are blaspheming his name by refusing to listen to his angels. So he's here, 
And who else is here? His angels. To send them with truth and light. This is the strong, almost overmastering delusion. She tells us exactly that if it were possible, it would deceive the very elect. Well, we know now exactly what, she's, what that means. This is the strong, overmastering delusion. They're going to ch- say they changed the Sabbath. They're going to come down pretending to be angels from heaven. This is why the Bible asks us to prove all things. This verse maybe changed my life when I first came to understand it. Because it's asking me to not just look at the book and say, okay, the book says and I'm done. It's saying go outside of the pages. Look at what's really happening in the world and come back and when you see that they match up, hold on to it. Don't let it go. Hold fast to that which is good. Hang tight to what you find to be true. Don't let it go. Because what's going to happen? Strange winds of doctrine are going to come blowing in. The waves of persecution and temptation and anxiety are going to start beating on the house. And if it's built on sand, what's it going to do? It's going to fall. And the fall of it will be great. But, brothers and sisters, Satan's coming back to pretend to be Jesus. These angels are going to pretend to be apostles. Are they going to use scriptures like this? Let's find out. Spiritualists are increasing in numbers. They will come to men who have the truth as Satan came to Christ, tempting them to manifest their power and to work miracles and give evidence of their being favored of God and of their being the people who have the truth. Interesting. So these spiritualists, as these miracles come about, they're going to come to people who believe and say, well, if you're really the thing, uh, Go ahead and do some miracles just like Jesus did. You know, said Satan said to Christ, if thou be the Son of God, command these stones be made bread. Herod and Pilate asked Christ to work a miracle when his life was on trial. Their curiosity was aroused, but Christ did not gratify them with a miracle because that would be doing what Satan did. Make these stones made bread, and he wouldn't do it because it would not have resulted in the conversion of the heart Spiritualists will press the matter to engage in controversy with ministers who teach the truth. So if you plan on ministering to those about the truth, expect at some point you to be pressed on these these issues. If they decline, they will dare them. They will quote the scripture as did Satan to Christ, prove all things. So they're going to take scripture and twist it. And say, well, we've manifested miracle working powers as a sign that God's on our side. Prove that you also have this power. It says in the scriptures, prove all things. Is that what that verse means? We need to prove all things by showing we have miraculous miracle working powers at our fingertips? No. No. We prove all things by showing a living faith. By reflecting Christ's character. By eating and drinking of the word of God. But their idea of proving is to listen to their deceptive readings and attending their meetings in their circles. But in their gatherings, the angels of darkness assume the forms of dead friends and communicate with them as angels of light. You know, if you're a secular person and you find your way into one of these meetings, it's going to be really hard (laughs) to know the difference. You're going to think these people have the truth, because you just watched some miraculous event happen in front of you. You don't have care for the word because you're trusting your senses and your heart. And while some of these things, seances and things like that have been happening for, gosh, probably millennia, what we're going to deal with in the future is going to be nothing like what we've seen in the past. It will be similar, but to amplified to a degree like we've never seen before. Their loved ones will appear in robes of light as familiar to them, as familiar a sight as when they were upon the earth. They will teach them and converse with them. Many will be deceived by this wonderful, wonderful display of Satan's power. The only safety for God's, the people of God is to be thoroughly conversant with their Bibles and be intelligent upon the reasons for our faith in regard to the sleep of the dead. Okay, brothers and sisters, if we're preparing for a war that's coming, we're getting a roadmap here, and we're able to take this off the page and start putting it practically into our lives. As you're going through your studies, 
you know, obviously you can casually read, but start making these points, knowing that you're going to have to help our brothers and sisters on the state of the dead and the Sabbath. And obviously the other points as well. But really start to hone some of your studies and some of your materials around these points. They're going to be important. So here, how, when all these things start happening, how are we going to tell the difference what's real and what's fake? The Bible gives us instruction to the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, it is because there is how much light in them? None. Zero. Now the crazy part is, the devil likes mixing truth and error. He likes giving you actually a whole lot of truth and just a little bit of error. And that's the most dangerous one. The one that's mostly error with a little bit of truth, that's easy to see. But he takes this verse, and when he comes, he's going to be focused on this. He's going to start talking about the testimony. Well, I am healing as Jesus did. I am doing as Jesus did. But guess what he's not going to exalt? The law. The law is going to be one of those key places where these spirits and Satan will not be uplifting. Even if they're quoting scripture, even if they're pressing on points that we think, well, that sounds pretty true, we'll ask them about the law. Well, what about the seventh-day Sabbath? There's going to be no way those spirits can say, yes, worship on the seventh day. It won't. It will not. These spirits will not speak to in accordance with the law, even if they look like they're in accordance with the testimony. Because the testimony is of Jesus Christ. He's coming back pretending to be Jesus Christ. So we have to be careful. It is the law that will expose most of what's happening here in the future. But the people of God will not be misled. The teachings of this false Christ are not in accordance with the scriptures. His blessing is pronounced upon the worshipers of the beast and his image, the very class upon whom the Bible declares that God's unmingled wrath shall be poured out. The scriptures are our safeguard, understanding why the law still stands. The earth has almost reached the place where God will permit the destroyer to work his will upon it. The substitution of the laws of men for the law of God, the exaltation by merely human authority, of Sunday in the place of the Bible Sabbath is the last act in the drama. So as we get closer to this and we see this Sabbath Sunday issue, how close are we to the end? Very close. We are very close. Now, the last seven last plagues are the last judgment upon the earth, right? So if we want to try to get a roadmap in our head of when this is going to happen... Let's take a look. When this substitution becomes universal, God will reveal himself. Interesting. So, as this Bible Sunday Sabbath issue comes to a peak, as it reaches that peak, and what's the peak? When this substitution becomes universal. universal. Oddly enough, what does the word Catholic mean? Universal. Universal. When it becomes universal, so not when it starts just in America, but when it becomes universal, God will reveal himself. And not to get too controversial, but in Daniel 12, 1, it says, and Michael stands up. He will arise. It's not saying he will arrive. He will arise. What causes Michael to stand up? The universal adoption of Sunday. Interesting. I didn't know that before. I had thought I'd related it a lot to uh, the death decree. And maybe it is in relation to this, but we see definitively that its substitution becoming universal makes God arise in his majesty to shake terribly the earth. And when does the earth shake terribly? At the return of Jesus. Interesting. Okay, so (laughs) who cares about a day, right? I can worship God on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. It's all holy to me. I've heard this reasoning before. Have you guys heard this reasoning before? So why is Sunday such a big deal? Who cares about a day? Well, let's go to the book of Ezekiel. When God was taking Ezekiel through and showing him all the abominations of the people. Now, before we get to this one, just before this, he takes him and he sees sees behind secret walls and he sees all the idols of Jerusalem and these men worshiping these idols. And you see God here is creating a structure, a tiered system. He said, you think the idols are bad? 
behind this secret wall. Let me show you a greater abomination. Then he tells us something else. We'll see here in a second. And then he goes and he said, you think that was bad. Let me show you a greater abomination. So are all these abominations equal in the sight of God? There seems to be a hierarchy. Interesting. He said also unto me, turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house. So is this uh, happening at a Buddhist temple? It's happening at the gate of the Lord's house. So these believers or non-believers? Well, they proclaim to be believers. Otherwise, what are they doing at the Lord's house? The gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north, and behold, there sat a woman weeping for Tammuz. That's interesting. We're going to get into that a little bit. Then he said unto me, Hast thou seen this, O son of man? Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations of these. Wait. A woman weeping, which is obviously some form of worship. She's, she's lamenting. She's in, in agony over Tammuz, who by this point in history, Tammuz is way back in history. This seems to me like putting a God before God, in a sense. And here he says, there's a greater abomination than this. What is it? And he brought me into the inner courts of the Lord's house. So now this isn't just a believer. Who is this? Priests. Pastors. Ministers. Not only professed believers, but active agents seemingly in the government of God here on earth. He brought me to the inner court, and behold, at the door of the temple, between the porch and the altar, were about 25 men, with their backs towards the temple of the Lord, and their faces towards the sun, and they worship the worship the sun. And this is the last of the things that he calls abominable. So where does God place sun worship in the hierarchy? The worst thing, most abominable thing possible because it's not just affecting the people, it's affecting who? The priests, the pastors, the ministers, those who stand up there and proclaim to teach the law and the prophets. And here they are, worshiping the sun. Interesting. So amongst the hierarchy, sun worship seems to be a big problem for God. So now I want to kind of go in and take a look at sun worship and its relationship with the first day of the week. Sun worship, first day. Sun worship, first day. They are interconnected, and we're going to see, uh, take a look at that now. Sun worship has been, previ- has been practiced by many cultures through history. The origins of sun worship can be traced back through ancient times where many civilizations, especially who? Babylonians, okay? In the book of Daniel, the head of gold is who? It's Babylon. In the end of time, the harlot likened to who? Babylon. This is one system through through the stream of time, and we're going to see what has connected it through all this time. Especially Babylonians believed the sun was a powerful and benevolent force. The chief god of Babylon, Marduk, and who knows who built the Tower of Babel and the, the city of Babylon? It was Nimrod. Who was Nimrod? And we're going to look at that here in a bit. So Nimrod was worshipped as Marduk and was often associated with the sun and was considered what? Creator of the world. When we worship on the Sabbath, what are we commemorating? The creator of the world. Creation. Interesting. Okay. So this sun worship is linked to worshipping an entity that created the world. They also worship the goddess of sky and fertility, whose name is Ishtar, also known as Semiramis and Isis, who is associated with the sun and the morning star. It is worth noting, sun worship was not exclusive to the Babylonians. Ancient cultures such as Egyptians, do we see sun worship in ancient Egypt? Absolutely. Incans and Aztecs also had strong traditions of solar worship. I find this particularly fascinating because before I became a Christian, I was looking at how the ancient Egyptians built the pyramids. Incredible skill, technology, mathematics went into these. But then I found that, well, the Incans built pyramids. The Aztecs built pyramids. Do you know where the most pyramids on planet Earth reside? China. Did you guys know that? They've covered their pyramids with trees so you can't see them. 
but there was a documentary filmmaker who was allowed in in the 70s, and he got some footage of these pyramids. So around the world, they were using these pyramid structures, and in every single instance, it was uplifting sun worship. Across the world, the Egyptians didn't talk to the Incans, yet here they are worshiping the same deity and building the same structures to worship that deity. So let's get into the story of Nimrod a little bit and Tammuz because we see the Bible gives us very real historical perspective on these figures. While most people will call them legends or fables, and what does legend and fable mean? Not real. Well, was Nimrod real? We're going to look at that. And we saw Tammuz being wept for at the the doors of the, the Lord's court. So there's something here the Bible is pointing us to. The legend of Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz is associated with the origins of sun worship and the origins of very ancient Near East religions. So this is kind of back to what I was saying earlier. There's only two options. When I went and was comparing all the world's religions to see who had the truth or what were the commonalities, I kind of ventured off to ancient India and the Far East, ancient Asia, Because I figured those are the oldest cultures on earth, right? I mean, those guys must have the goods. But when you actually look at their records, their historical records, you'll find that they only go back a few thousand years. They never predate Babylon. Never. Even though you'll have things, well, oh, these Sanskrit writings are from 22,000 years ago. There's no proof of that. The things we can prove is they go back a few thousand years, and when I looked at what was provable, what they were teaching back at that time, it was sun worship. In the Far East, both India and Asia, it was the principal god of the most primitive early forms of worship were worship of the sun. And here we see Nimrod, Semiramis, and Tammuz were the origins of these various beliefs in sun worship in these Near East religions. According to the legend, Nimrod was a powerful king who ruled over the city of Babylon. Is that legend or historical fact? Hmm. He was known for his great strength and his ability to conquer other nations. He's said to have built the famous Tower of Babel. So, (laughs) if he's a legend, what does the Tower of Babel become? Because he built it. It must be fable or legend. Is that true? I don't think so. So, he built it in order to reach the heavens and make a name for himself also to avoid the flood a second time, even though God promised not to do that by water again. Nimrod's wife, Semiramis, is said to become pregnant while her husband was away on a military campaign. That's not good. She claimed that her child was conceived miraculously. Well, that's a good out. And it's, a, it's a, similar to another story I know of a virgin named Mary. And that the father was the sun god. Who was the child? She named the child Tammuz. So when that woman's working, uh, weeping outside of the Lord's court, she's weeping for the sun god and declared that he was the incarnation of her deceased husband, Nimrod. So her son is also her husband. So it's kind of a weird, weird setup. And you'll see in Egyptian culture, ancient Babylonian culture, woman with child. Have you seen in Catholic churches, woman with child? Oftentimes, in some of them, she has exposed breast to suckle the child. And in Catholic teaching, they teach that you can't go directly to Jesus because of his wrath. You need to go to Mary first. She'll present her breast to him and suckle him, and then he'll be tamed down so you can go to Jesus. Wow. That is Semiramis and Tammuz, mother-son worship. People who see these stories from before Christ's time will say that Christ's story is a knockoff. And I battled with this because I saw also that these stories, a lot of them, a savior child coming in, they came before Jesus. So you're left with two options. Either Jesus is just like the rest and he's just a spinoff of those, or Satan knew the scriptures before they happened in the world, And he created counterfeits. And he tried to create so many counterfeits that people couldn't tell the real from the fake unless they went where? The Bible. 
And I found that to be fascinating because he did the same thing in the 1800s with Adventism. Right as the light of Sister White was rising, so did Mary Baker Eddy with Christian Science. So did Helena Blavatsky with Theosophy and New Age Spiritual Teachings. And Joseph Smith, the Mormon leader. All in the 1800s, all prolific writers on religious issues. Was Satan trying to muddy the water so you couldn't tell the difference? Sure worked on me when I heard Ellen White and a prophet of God in this little denomination. I'm, no, I'm like, oh boy, here we go. We, we've got the same problem as we have with Joseph Smith and Mary Baker Eddy. But what changed is you compare it to the law and the testimony. You prove all things. You go to the scriptures. And when you do that, my goodness, one stands out so much more than the other. It's not even close. Ellen White is exactly who we claim her to be. After Nimrod's death, Semiramis became the queen regent and became to promote the worship of Tammuz as God. She claimed that Tammuz was the son of the sun god and that he had power to bring fertility to the land and to bring what? Dead back to life. Interesting. Okay, so this sun worship has a lot going on in it that we see when God's making this hierarchy, he's considering the full depth of what this sun worship entails and it connects to to the very deceptions that we're going to be battling at the end of time. It's going to be over Sunday and the state of the dead. And here's the sun god bringing the dead back to life. Is this the same story as ancient Babylon playing out in our world here in the future? It's going to. It's crazy. It's absolutely crazy. In the Bible, Nimrod is mentioned in the book of Genesis as a descendant of Ham, Noah's evil son. Okay, was Noah real? I think it's a pretty, pretty fair case. You know, I, I have witnessed to some Jewish people and we go back and forth on a lot of topics, and they say a lot of the stories, even the Egyptian uh, persecution and the whole Red Sea crossing is all allegorical. But there's a problem with that, because Moses was a real guy. I mean, he's like one of the main <laughs> people that they uplift in Judaism. Yet, because the Bible's given us a lineage of people, we know who Moses' dad was, and who Moses' dad dad was, and who Moses' dad's dad's dad was. We have this line of history. So I ask him, at what point did uh, Moses' great-great-great-grandfathers become uh, allegorical, mythical? They have to be real because Moses had to come from somewhere, and he came from Noah's line, and Noah's came from Seth's line. So we see that God even gives us a genealogy that no other religious text even dares to touch, gives you a single genealogy going back to the beginning of time. So anybody who says these are allegorical, they're going to have to contend with, because we get to real historical figures, because it gets far enough in the future, at what point did the, the hereditary line become imaginary? And they can't answer that question. So he said, oh, and just to go back really quick, do you know what they call Semiramis, one of her names? They say the queen, they call her the queen of heaven. Guess what the Catholics call Mary? Queen of heaven. So they've substituted one for the other. Even though the name Mary, I feel really bad for Mary because she's been dragged through the mud in this whole thing. But uh, this is the, the Mary worship in Catholicism is Semiramis worship. It's even why they show her so often with her son because it's Semiramis and Tammuz that you're actually looking at. Okay, so he's said to be a mighty hunter before the Lord and the founder of the cities of Babel, Eric, Akkad, and Alkalna in Shinar, Mesopotamia. So he built a number of cities. Are we saying all these cities are allegorical or were they real cities? It was Mesopotamia a real place or was it pretend? This is all real stuff, historical stuff. Nimrod is often portrayed as a powerful and ambitious leader who rebelled against God and sought to establish his own kingdom and power. Who does that sound like? Satan. Thank you, sister. The fruits of the character are reflecting the king they serve. And he was really, from what we're dealing with today, much of the source of what has become much of the belief systems that are in the world today. It says, according to some interpretations of the Bible, Nimrod was the leader of the people who built the Tower of Babel, and he is seen as the antagonist of God and the embodiment of human pride and rebellion. So the battle is between, still, Christ and Satan. So now, for me, I'm like, okay, the worship of the sun is bad. I get it. But what does it have to do with the first day of the week? When we look at ancient cultures, 
we're going to see why they put Sunday, the worship of the sun, as the first day of the week. In all these ancient cultures, Sunday was always the first day. Why? Sunday worship is the setting aside of the first day of the week for the worship of the sun deity, known in Babylon as Tammuz. And I, these, are, these are neutral sources I've pulled from. These are not Adventist sources, right? And I want you to look at the four powers that they pointed out. The sun worship of Babylon was for Tammuz. In Persia, it was for Mithra. In Greece, it was Helios. In Rome, it was Sol Invictus. Who are these four kingdoms? These are the four kingdoms in the book of Daniel. A neutral source pointing out sun worship linked to four major kingdoms, which are the four major kingdoms of the earth pointed out in the Bible. Is that a coincidence? I don't think so. Sun worship became the dominant religion in all ancient civilizations stemming from Mother Babylon to India, China, Africa, Greece, Rome, Mexico, South America, Egypt, and Europe. This is the system that we're battling against. This is the false worship system that God has been tugging with mankind over since the beginning, essentially. The first day of the week was the preeminent position in the week, was therefore given to the worship of the sun in the calendar of the ancients. The reason Sunday is the first day of the week is because their God, the sun God, was the most preeminent entity that they worshiped. So where do you place that preeminent entity? First. First you put that. And here, the the worship of the true God, the last day. What a contrast, right? I never knew that. That the reason the first day of the week and the sun worship are so attached together is because, of course, you put your best thing first. So, brothers and sisters, as people clamor about who cares about a day, it's really a first day versus the last day issue. The sun worship of a false system and the true worship of a true God system. And I found it fascinating to see that this worship on the first day extended to all of these major kingdoms. In each one, the first day was indicative of sun worship. However, some scholars argue that the adoption of Sunday as the day of worship may have been influenced by the Roman Empire's practice of honoring the sun god Sol Invictus on Sunday. It was used as the first day of the week. In ancient times, the Babylonians called the day of the week Shapatu. The ancient Egyptians called it the day of the sun. The Romans called it Dies Solis, which means day of the sun. So we're seeing the theme here. The reason it's placed in first position is because this is the primary God with which they worship. Sunday and first day are interconnected always. And we saw when Satan comes back, he's going to say, let's blame those who are worshiping on the seventh day. So he's uplifting and not even trying to pretend he's uplifting the first day. And uh, I don't know if we have any existing Catholics or Sunday keepers in here, but... There's no question on who gave the authority to change the worship from the seventh day to the first day. No question. I could, I could do a whole two-hour presentation just on quotes from the Catholics themselves on this issue. So who changed it? The Catholic Church changed the observance of the Sabbath to Sunday by right of the divine, infallible authority given to her by her founder, Jesus Christ. Did Jesus give anybody infallible authority but except for himself? It was Constantine, yes, but this is the, he was a converted Christian by that point. So he was saying it, it was a, a Christian. Well, the Catholic Church was born out of, out of that. And so the change of that observance stems from Constantine's decree to make a Sunday law, essentially, and then the Catholic Church, because it didn't happen like a light switch, the Catholic Church over time got the greater whole of Christianity to start adopting this as... as say again? Yeah, and we're going to touch on some of those later this afternoon. Check this out. The Protestants claiming the Bible to be their only guide of faith has no warrant for observing Sunday. In this matter, who? Who? The Seventh-day Adventist is the only consistent Protestant. (laughs) And who told us that? 
is a Catholic publication. All of these are from Catholic sources, not Protestant. The Catholic Church, for over a thousand years before the existence of a Protestant, by virtue of her divine mission, changed the day from Saturday to Sunday. The Adventists are the only body of Christians with the Bible as their teacher. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Who can find no warrant in its pages for the change of day from the 7th to the 1st, hence their application, Seventh-day Adventists. Gosh, it gives me chills. I love it. <laughs> now, we, need, we, we can fall from this if we're not careful. We can't rest on our laurels now, but this is a good foundation to work from. Practically everything Protestants regard as essential or important they have received from the Catholic Church. The Protestant mind does not seem to realize that in accepting the Bible, observing the Sunday, and keeping Christmas and Easter, they are accepting authority of the spokesman of the church, the Pope. And at some point, uh, we'll look at Christmas and Easter in this lens. So how many Protestants are keeping Sunday? Almost all of them. How many are keeping Christmas? How many are keeping Easter? When it says she's the mother of all churches, who are her daughters? In Protestant churches. They, the Protestants, deem in their duty, deem it their duty to keep Sunday holy. Why? Because the Catholic Church tells them to do so. They have no other reason. The observance of Sunday thus comes to be an ecclesiastical law entirely distinct from the divine law of Sabbath observance. The author of Sunday law is the Catholic Church. So, you know, it's really hard because I don't want to condemn anyone. There's God's people in churches all over the world, including in the Catholic Church. They don't know the difference. But when we're looking at an at a information, evidence-based argument to say, how does God feel about sun worship and who made sun worship the day of religion? It's the dragon and the, false, and the beast of, of Revelation. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. The infallible vicar of God. Correct. That's a, that's a great time to look at the man of sin. Oh, yes. Uh, she's saying essentially when you go to a Catholic priest and ask him if this is the case and show him with these quotes, they're not going to deny that. But oftentimes, the Catholic receiving that information will default to, well, the Pope has the divine right to do such things as given to him by Jesus Christ. As we saw earlier, they have this divine right. And so there's uh, an opportunity there to study the man of sin and the beast system of Revelation 13 and 16 and Daniel 7 and Daniel 2. There's a lot of opportunities once that door is open, I hope, but ultimately the Holy Spirit is the one that impresses upon them to explore that issue more. Yeah, that's where the confusion lies. But then you look at the Greek word there, this, the Petra, the rock, and you'll see in all other instances that rock is referring to Jesus Christ. Even in the Old Testament, it says, who is our, our rock but God? Um, so we see that that has, as with many things, it's truth mingled with error. But it's a most delicate error that most people can't see. And if you read it on the surface, it does look like that's what Christ is saying to Peter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it does. It does. But if you're not uh, studied and eating and drinking from the Word of God and engaging in this, are you going to even take the time to battle? Or you, by one wind of doctrine, one objection, now you're like, oh, well, maybe do I, even, do I even have that right? So this is why we have to be consistently rooted, daily rooted in God's Word. So back to the question, why is Sunday such a big deal? Long story short, it breaks all four first commandments. All four of them. And what are the first four commandments? Our relationship with God. 
So it's a big problem. It's a big problem stemming back to the man of metals, the very head, and trickling all the way down to the feet and to the toes until the toes and the feet are destroyed by a stone not cut with hands. This is the system we're against, and these are the reasons why God has such a problem with this sun worship. I'll quickly run through them. It's idol worship. It's the worship of Tammuz, which obviously represent the children of disobedience, and Nimrod representing the children of disobedience, Ham representing the children of disobedience and their connection to Cain. He removes God as the creator of the universe and changes his commandments. It's claiming it is God's day of rest uh, in God's name, breaking, not taking the God's, Lord's name in vain. So we see here, it's just kind of a summary, the Catholic Church claims Sunday is their mark of invention and authority. The first day and sun worship have always been connected. Prophecy shows the papacy gained church-state power and world dominion, but it will lose it. So we saw, even though there's only four powers and the Roman power is the fourth one, we see it loses power. And who rises to power in that period of time when it's lost it is the false prophet, America. And America's role is to get the power back to the first beast before him. So it's going to lose it, and prophecy shows America will also gain church-state power, and when it does, it creates this mark or this image, and when the image is created, now the mark is applicable to people. The final controversy will be over the seventh-day versus first-day worship systems. This is the clash, the seventh-day versus the first-day worship systems. So if these interpretations are correct, we should be seeing it play out in the real world. We should see Sunday as a main day proposed for all solutions. Is that what's happening? I think so. And if we have time in the afternoon, I'll show you guys a little bit of this Sunday movement happening. There's even a TikTok uh, movement called the Sunday Reset, right? So as many of you already know, we'll always see is Sunday. And it says, okay, come out of the pages, take a look at the world and what's happening. A lot of Sunday is happening. Uh, We should see evidence of this within the writings of the papacy and specifically the Jesuits. So what are we going to do this afternoon? We're going to go through this document written by Jesuit Brett McLaughlin, where it says, Recovering the Sabbath, Sunday observance as a universal human right and civic cooperationism. We're going to look at all this this afternoon because this is the basis of what's coming. This Sunday observance is a what? universal human right. Now, um, there's two modes of preparation. I'll liken it to a sports analogy quickly, and then we'll, we're pretty much done. This is the last slide here. When you're preparing to play an opponent, you get your team ready, you practice, you get your plays ready, you go through your routines, but what do you also do? You scout what they're going to do. You take a look at their game plan, what their strengths are, So you can work into your game plan and you have your strengths regardless of what they do, but you also want to be prepared for how they're going to come at you. And so that's what we're doing when we look at this. We're not saying this from our own team's Advent perspective. We're saying we're going to take a scouting report, look at what the enemy sees Sunday as. Because ultimately, the reason Sunday laws, and I'll just quickly touch on this, the reason Sunday laws didn't come in in the form of blue laws initially from God's our team's perspective was a rejection of the message of righteousness by faith okay but from the enemy's perspective the blue laws didn't work for another reason and something needs to change in the future and that's what we're going to look at today as we do a scouting report on what the enemy sees Sunday as thank you brothers and sisters if you would uh, one more time please uh, pray with me Oh, great and merciful God in heaven, you are truly the creator of the universe. You are truly the giver of all life, and every good gift we have in our lives is from you. There's nothing we have that is good that is not from you. And so, Lord, I didn't think I'd have the words to speak today, so thank you, Holy Father. Thank you for giving my mouth the ability to get through this topic. And Lord, that I pray that the people be edified, not just of themselves, that the edification spread like a wildfire and a fervent passion to share with other people, to show them the truth, to say, as Sister White showed, to give every ounce, every effort, every bit of what we have to you, Lord. And whether we see the fruits of it in front of us is not what we seek. 
We seek just your will to be done. We seek your character to continually reflect in who we are. That by the end state of each one in here, Lord, I just pray with all my heart that the end reflection is a reflection of Jesus Christ and not of ourselves. And Lord, that in that, others may be drawn to it and see that there's something different. And Lord, I'm so grateful that we can ask the creator of the universe and that your son, being the worthy lamb, that his blood has atoned for us and continues to work in the heavenly sanctuary, Lord, for those who have yet to convert. And Lord, Father, we know that this is going to come to an end at some point. So strengthen us in faith. Continue to reveal your will within our hearts and minds that we may be just stewards of your goodwill. We thank you for all this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen.